so now we're going to talk about population policies. Pronatalist population policies promote reproduction in bigger families. They are often called expansive policies. Policies such as tax breaks for families with children and anti-abortion laws are considered pronatalist. Adolf Hitler was trying to encourage the growth of his country's Aryan population when he established pronatalist policies to reward Aryan women with public recognition for having many babies. Hitler's racist policies were also considered eugenic population policies because they encouraged the reproduction of only certain groups of people and discouraged or terminated the growth of others. In the 1950s, Chairman Mao Zedong encouraged Chinese families to reproduce by rewarding families with medals and cash prizes for having many children. Currently, former East Germany is engaging in advertisements and promotions to encourage higher birth rates in an attempt to reverse the approaching underpopulation, which, uh, when, when not enough people will be able to fill jobs and fulfill the responsibilities necessary to sustain society. In contrast, Antinatalist population policies encourage a reduction in fertility rates. They're often called restrictive policies because they limit population growth. India has adopted antinatalist approaches to try and reduce its fertility rates. Abortion is readily acceptable and are as are contraceptive measures. Can't talk. In fact, the government has been accused of forcing women to be sterilized, a procedure that terminates humans' ability to reproduce. In the 1980s, China adopted the antinatalist one-child policy, which punished families for having more than one child in many regions of China. This policy was created under Deng Xiaoping's administration in response to the pronatalist approach of his predecessor, Mao, who created overpopulation problems in China. Allowed to have just one child, many families prefer to have only boys to carry on the family name and be able to earn more money, since men have more earning power in Chinese society. This led to female infanticide with some families aborting or killing their female newborns so that they could try and have a male child instead. It also led to gender imbalances because of some regions had more men than women. This is measured by the sex ratio, the number of males per 100 females. Some demographers link these gender imbalances to China's HIV AIDS rates as a result of men being unable to find wives and thus hiring prostitutes who are more likely to be HIV positive. Now we're going to talk about short-term local movement. There are various classifications to this one. So, the first one is cyclic movement. It's what you do on your daily routine from your home and back. The second one is seasonal movement, which is leaving your home region for a short time in response to a change in season. The third one is periodic movement. This is where you stay for a certain amount of time, like serving in the military or going to college. And the last one is transhumans. This is where you're following animals slash herds around. Now we're going to talk about the criticisms of the demographic transition model. Critics of the demographic transition model point to its being based on England's transition from a subsistence economy to an industrialized society. They believe that not all countries will pass through the same demographic transition pattern. For example, some African countries benefited from the diffusion of medicine and food supplies from more developed countries, a pattern that was not seen in England's case. Further, demographic growth in 19th century England occurred in the millions, not the billions of people seen in today's transitions. England also progressed from stage 2 to stage 3 over the course of 100 years, but today stage 2 countries are being pushed to enter stage 3 at a much faster pace. Some demographers proposed adding a fifth stage, the DTM. This new stage would show a continuing delay in this crude birth rate, as seen in many more developed countries such as France and Germany. This would show the growing population patterns noticed throughout some of the wealthier countries. Short-term local movements and activity space. Activity space is the area in which you travel on a daily basis. Activity space analyzes people's daily movements that do not classify as migration. So, for example, in an advanced society, people's activity space are going to be wide because of huge amounts of transportation, like trains, railroads, buses, and cars than compared to a place in South Africa whose activity space are going to be about a mile. Global Variations in the Demographic Transition Importantly, the demographic transition demonstrates that the crude death rate is a function of technological innovation and improvements in healthcare, whereas the crude birth rate is more of a function of cultural choice and individual decision by people. <laughs> The crude birth rate often takes longer to change unless it is forcibly changed at a governmental level, such as in China's one child policy. Different countries are in different dem demographic transition model stages. These varying stages reflect, to some degree, their economic and demographic development. All countries have progressed beyond stage one, largely 
bill through the diffusion of medical technology from more developed countries in the late 20th century during the medical revolution. With improved medicine, people in these poorer regions have begun living longer lives, which coupled with the already high birth rates led to a higher population growth rates. Many of the poorest countries are pushed into stage two. Most Latin American and Asian countries remain in stage three at moderate growth, while most African countries remain in a high growth stage in stage two. Many Western European countries are at the end of stage four, zero population growth equilibrium, and pushing toward a potential stage five, if it does in fact exist. Japan is also facing the fifth stage, or the growing population problem. Instead of encouraging immigration to fill jobs, once occupied by the growing number of elderly people, Japan is trying to increase the age of its workers. We're going to talk about the gravity model. The gravity model resembles Isaac Newton's theory of gravitational pull. It states that larger places attract more migrants. For example, people are willing to move from El Paso to Los Angeles, even though it's 712 miles apart, which is 2.7 times farther than El Paso to Tucson. However, the model does counteract and say that the closer places also attract more migrants than do more distant places. An example of this would be people from Mexico moving to the U.S. because it is closer. In all, the model does propose an equation that balances distance and size in trying to predict spatial interaction. Like every other model, it has limitations. It does not factor in migration selectivity factors. Okay, this is the epidemiological transition model. The epidemi epidemiological transition model focuses on the cause of death in each stage of the demographic transition model. For example, pandemics like the Black Plague affect the crude death rate in stage one, while diseases such as cholera, associated with overcrowding during massive movements into cities, affects the crude death rate in stage two. The crude death rate is mostly affected in stage three and four by diseases associated with growing numbers of elderly people, such as cancer and heart diseases. Some demographics demographers call for a fifth stage in the epidemiological transition model, one showing the re-emergence of infections and parasites and diseases that were once thought to be eradicated during stage three, such as the bubonic plague and smallpox. This is speculated to occur because of improved transportation and space-time compression, allowing humans to contact each other more rapidly. This was seen recently in the SARS epidemic and the swine flu outbreaks of the early 20th century, 21st century. Now we're going to talk about what kind of people travel where. We're going to talk about migration selectivity. This explains that the decision to migrate often fits into a predictable pattern based on age, income, and socioeconomic factors. In other words, someone is likely to migrate based on personal, social, and economic factors. For example, most individuals move six times in their lives before the age of 25. Uh, most start traveling after the age of 18 because that's where they start living their homes, go off to college, and further on. So the most influential factor in migration selectivity is age. The next section is going to be about major regions of dislocation and refugees. These regions are just going to tell where people are being forced to migrate as refugees because they were being persecuted. The first region is Sub-Saharan Africa. This is one area of the world with the largest refugee crisis. You have millions of people fleeing from Rwanda and Congo because of tribal and ethnic issues. In the Darfur region of northeastern Sudan, you also have issues going on between the government and the rebels, between the Muslims and animists, and between the north versus the south. Going on to the next region is going to be the Middle East. Uh, you have a huge emigration, aka dislocation, of Palestinians due to the formation of the Israeli state to the neighboring Southwest Asian countries like Sudan and Jordan. So that basically means that the Israeli straight, uh, state is spreading and the Palestinians weren't really happy about it. The next region is going to be Europe. Uh, in Europe, the fall of Yugoslavia in the Balkans led to causing 7 million refugees fleeing their homes during this conflict. In Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War caused 2 million refugees to be dislocated. In South Asia, because of a feud with the Sinhalese government, Sri Lanka had 1 million of its citizens dislocated. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about push and pull factors. Migration is usually not a random act, but is based on thoughtful consideration. Often migration decisions are based on a combination of push and pull factors, influencing a person's movement. Push factors are the negative influences that make a person want to move away, such as high taxes, high crime rates, and abusive governments, among others. Pull factors are the positive influences that pull a person toward a particular place, such as affordable real estate, good schools, and clean parks. The assignment of what is a push and what is a pull factor is highly personal. For example, being your family members may be a positive pull factor to some people, but a negative push factor to others. Migration streams are a pathway from a place of origin to a destination. For example, when the Atlantic slave trade happened, there was a major migration stream, net out migration. For every migration stream, there has been a migration counter stream, net in migration. This is the movement of people moving back to the origin from the new place. For example, when people are going from Mexico to USA, there's always going to be some people who will not have paperwork or have some kind of issues that will result them into migrating back. Okay, now we're going to talk about some major migrations. About 3% of the world's people have migrated from their countries of origin. North America, Oceania, and Europe have net in migrations, while Asia, Africa, and Latin America have net out migrations. About 50% of Southwest Asia's population are immigrants, making it the region with the highest percentage in the world. The United States has seen three major waves of immigration, and each wave was originated in a different region. In the colonial era, from 1607 until 1776, Europe and Africa were the primary sources of migrants, both voluntary and involuntary, to the United States. Many Europeans were escaping political and religious persecution in Europe, while many Africans were forced to come to America as slaves. The 19th century saw continued migration from Europe. Before 1840s, most immigrants in America originated in England, but in the 1940s and 1850s, or 1840s and 1850s, Massive numbers of Irish and Germans made the trip across the Atlantic in search of opportunity. More than 4.2 million people migrated in the 1840s and 1850s, more than twice that seen since the New World had been colonized. Immigration to the United States slumped during the Civil War, but surged again in the early 20th century, fueled by the Industrial Revolution. This wave, starting around 1907, came not just from Northern and Western Europe, but also from areas like Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. European migration had never reached such heights after World War I. In the late 1800s, British geographer Ernest Ravenstein identified 11 generalizations about migration, some of which still apply today. I'm going to talk about five of the 11. The first one, the majority of migrants travel short distances. Migration occurs step by step. A migrant moving from Massachusetts to Florida might stop in North Carolina first, and then move on to his final destination of Florida. This is called step migration, when a person has a long-distance goal in mind and achieves it in a series of small steps. Related to this idea is the rule of short-distance migration, which states that most people never move a long distance. For example, you and your wife can't stand living with your parents, so you want to move, but you still want to be close enough so that your parents can watch the kids, therefore you only move five miles away. Often, in the progress of making the long journey to a final destination, migrants will find an opportunity they like so much that they just stop their journey and stay in that place they found along the way. This is called an intervening opportunity. Suppose, for instance, that on your migration to Florida, you stop in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and decide to stay there instead of proceeding on to Florida. You will have experienced the intervening opportunity at Chapel Hill. Intervening obstacles are barriers in a migratory journey. Financial problems, roadblocks, immigration requirements, and wars are just a few forms of the intervening obstacles that can prevent migrants from reaching their planned final destination. Two, migrants who are traveling a long way tend to move to larger cities and smaller cities. Ravenstein's idea was that the large city with all its job and opportunities had an almost magnetic pull that makes the long journey worthwhile. Keep in mind that during Ravenstein's life in the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was pulling people towards the big cities like Manchester and London. Today, this is somewhat true, but modern technology, such as the internet, makes big city amenities and jobs available in smaller towns. 3. Rural residents are more likely to migrate than urban residents. This was true in Ravenstein's time again because of the Industrial Revolution and its pull of rural dwellers in cities in search of job opportunities. And it's still true in many countries, such as China, because many rural folks in these developing countries are moving into large cities within 
their countries, such as Shanghai, Beijing, Mexico City, and Brasilia. Yet counter-urbanization is a noted trend in the United States, where the city dwellers are leaving crowded urban places for the suburbs and rural places. Four. Families are less likely to migrate across national borders than young adults. Ravenstein bases generalization on the observation that it is simply easier for single people to migrate than it is for whole families. For example, it's difficult for a family to move children and all their belongings over a border. In many cases, single people are less encumbered with responsibilities and are thus more mobile. And finally, the fifth one I'm going to talk about. Every migration stream creates a counter stream. Therefore, net migration is the number of people in the original flow minus the number of people in the opposite flow, or counter stream. A counter stream can be caused by many factors, sometimes economic, legal, or personal. Even the outmigration of Jews from Nazi Germany had a small counter stream back in back into Germany because of their capture and forced return by border officials in other countries refusing to let to shelter Jews from Nazi oppression. A less tragic example might be the counter stream of the young Chinese men who originally left their rural villages for new horizons in Chinese cities, only to reser- return with their dreams crushed to the rural villages after giving city life a try. Why do people migrate? The first reason would be because of push factors. These are the negative influence that makes a person want to move away like high taxes, high crimes, abusive governments, and among others. The second reason would be pull factors. These are the positive influences that pull a person to a place like clean streets, good houses, good schools, and among others. While some migrations from one place to another may have been voluntarily, there were some migrations that were forced upon them without their say. A good example would this be, again, the North Atlantic slave trade, where 30 million Africans were forced from their homes to migrate to the Americas. Another and the last reason would be that a person being a refugee. These are migrants that are fleeing uh, from their country because of some form of persecution or abuse that they're receiving from the country that they're living in.